Why do you want to be executed? Uh, I have to be. Uh, because I will kill again. When a normal prison is not enough, the sickest individuals are sent to one place. The last place they will ever see. Death Row. My role mainly is to make sure he is dead, make sure things have gone appropriately, that things were not unusual. Today, we look at some of the inmates that have graced the walls of death row. All the men here committing crimes so terrible, the state has decided they need to die. These are the worst of the worst and have been known around the world for their crimes. Aren't you afraid? No, I know where I'm going. I'm gonna be with the Lord. Do you wanna die? You want to oh man, if I if I was to uh, leave this planet, it wouldn't be no big deal to me because uh, this is a wicked, wicked world. Wicked world. But what you might not know is just what happened during these prisoners' last brutal days before death row. Condemned row, better known to you and me as death row. Here, prisoners live a life of complete solitude, waiting for their final day. Their handcuffs made to back out of their cells. Even their showers are individual cells themselves. Death row inmates are never allowed to be in contact with other inmates. Only the most violent and deadly inmates are housed here, making death row one of the most dangerous places to work. You just have to have an open eye, be very observant when working in death row. Some have been known to spend years, even decades, waiting for an execution date, often due to the appeals prisoners will attempt through the judicial system. In one of the loneliest places you can imagine, there is plenty of time for these killers to think about the consequences of their actions until they are taken to a final holding cell where their fate is finally sealed. This exact cell here is where they bring condemned prisoners 30 days before they're actually executed. Why do they use this cell? Because it's equipped with these cameras and they can watch them 24 hours a day. Often their crimes are so disturbing that many celebrate the day they are deprived of their lives, usually by the electric chair or lethal injection. An unprecedented crowd of hundreds started gathering before dawn. It took on a macabre circus-like atmosphere. Those celebrations were for the first killer on this list, and maybe one of the most sadistic of all, Ted Bundy. His eyes looked like he was almost a, a child, uh, and his mother called him doing something wrong. Um, it was a combination of, of just being sorry and and knowing that it was the end, it was the end of the line. As notorious as he was famous, Ted Bundy was responsible for hurting and taking the lives of at least 28 women between 1974 and 1978. The youngest victim was only 12. His reign of terror stretched across the United States, committing his crimes in six states from Oregon to Colorado. His story became so public that the entire nation was gripped with fear. Well, the very last moment, no one could be sure Bundy didn't have a last trick up his sleeve, a legal technicality. From a young age, Bundy seemed to lead an apparently normal childhood, with good grades at school and healthy relationships in his personal life. Underneath the surface, Bundy was a psychopath waiting to strike. Although we know of the 28 victims he confessed to, it's believed he could have taken hundreds of lives in his thirst for death. He would defend himself in a very public trial, and in the end, would receive three death sentences over two separate trials. It was while he was waiting on death row that he decided to tell the whole world what he had done. Well, listen, I've been kept in isolation for six months. I've been kept away from the press. I've been buried by you. You've been talking for six months. I think it's my turn now. Okay. All right. While appealing his crimes, Bundy went on a spree of television interviews showing the true nature behind this evil, unforgiving monster. One of the most famous of these appearances is with psychologist James Dobson. He showed no remorse for his actions, only thinking of himself. What's going through my mind right now is to use the minutes and hours that I have left as fruitfully as possible and see what happens. He even tries to blame the adult movie industry for his actions. This kind of literature contributed and helped mold and, and shape the kinds of violent behavior. It fueled your fantasies. Well, in, in the beginning, it fuels this kind of 
thought process. And then calmly, he describes the thought process that led him to become a cold-blooded murderer. I couldn't control it anymore, that these barriers that, that I had that had been, uh, I had learned as a child, uh, that had been instilled in me, were not enough to hold me back with respect to seeking out and, and harming someone. January 24th, 1989, Bundy's final day. He was unable to eat his final meal of steak and eggs. He is believed to have made a phone call to his family before being led to the final room he would ever step foot in again. One of the more bizarre chapters in recent American criminal history has come to an end. The scenes outside the prison when Ted Bundy was finally executed were like nothing that had ever been seen before as a large crowd gathered. The hearse carrying Bundy moved from the prison past a group of cheering spectators who had waited for Bundy to die and some said Bundy should have suffered more than he did. But this would not be the first time a serial killer's execution was celebrated, as our next case shows. John Wayne Gacy, often referred to as the killer clown, stands out as one of the most infamous and horrifying serial killers in American history. Born in 1942 in Chicago, Illinois, Gacy led a double life that helped hide his depraved acts. At first glance, Gacy appeared to be an average, even charismatic member of his community. He was a successful businessman known for entertaining children at local events dressed as a clown, which later became a nightmarish irony. However, behind what appeared to be a very normal suburban life lurked a predator who would ultimately claim the lives of at least 33 young men and boys. Gacy would lure his victims, often vulnerable young individuals, with promises of jobs or money. He would then hurt them and take their lives in a brutal fashion. The true extent of what he had done came to light in 1978, when the disappearance of 15-year-old Robert Peist led to a police investigation that uncovered the gruesome truth. The search of Gacy's home revealed horrifying evidence of his crimes, the remains of numerous victims buried beneath his house. His murder spree was first discovered on a cold December day when the first of his victims were found in the crawl space beneath his home. They were taken out one by one as the world watched. The chilling details and the sheer number of victims shocked the nation and sent the media into a frenzy. This was, at the time, the highest number of victims for a single killer. Following a high-profile trial in 1980, Gacy was convicted of his heinous crimes and sentenced to death. It was on death row that his behavior became even more unusual. He began to paint. But these pictures were disturbing images of clowns and skulls, among other less sinister paintings. Some of them were even sold at auction, which seems a little unnerving considering the reputation of the artist. As well as taking up art, Gacy also took up studying law, and his idea was to appeal his death sentence all by himself. But it was a futile attempt at freedom, as he was eventually given an execution date of May 1994. Before his death, he would give a series of bizarre interviews. Go ahead and kill me, but vengeance is mine, say it the Lord, because you will have executed somebody that didn't commit the crime. Despite being convicted 13 years earlier, he now denied any involvement in the crimes. When they paint the image that I was this monster who, who picked up like these altar boys along the street and swatted them like flies, I said, this is ludicrous. He even made the most ridiculous claims to back up his story. I've taken th uh, five and a half hours, three and a half hours of truth serum and under, under sodium amethyl, the maximum amount that I could have, it shows that I have no knowledge of the crime whatsoever. Needless to say, evidence of these sessions where he took truth serum is nowhere to be found. His final day was spent with his family and eating his last meal of fried chicken and fresh strawberries. As he was being prepared for his death, a crowd gathered outside the prison, patiently waiting for the news they had come for. Kill Death penalty demonstrators at the prison who favored the execution far outnumbered the candle-carrying death penalty opponents. Protests or no protests, 
John Wayne Gacy could not escape the inevitable. John Wayne Gacy was pronounced dead at 12.58 uh, uh, a.m. The killer's last words were defiant to the end, as he is reported to have looked over a prison guard and then uttered, kiss my ass. His behavior toward the guard in his final moments was nothing compared to what our next inmate said about her prison guards. Eileen Wernos was a troubled woman who became one of the most infamous female serial killers in America. And he said, I did the most horrendous crime in the whole wide world. She was abandoned when she was very young and sent to live with her grandparents. And at an early age, she began to sell her body in exchange for money and narcotics. Is it possible that her difficult home life led her to commit such terrifying crimes? Abandoned by her teenage mother when she was just six months old, Lee was raised by her alcoholic grandmother and a cruel grandfather who regularly beat her with his belt buckle. She was arrested several times between the ages of 14 and 22 for various crimes including robbery, but that was nothing compared to what she did between 1989 and 1990. Just like she did as a younger child, she went to selling her body on the streets. Only this time, her customers would become victims of a disturbing scheme that Warnos had begun. The killings all began like this. A middle-aged man pulled over to pick up Lee Wernos. Armed with a gun, she would lure the men into an isolated spot, each victim assuming they would be receiving her services. Instead, the victims would find themselves on the wrong end of the gun and facing certain death. She would be arrested in Florida and charged with taking the lives of six men. This would lead to an explosive trial where Warnos would play the victim and try to escape justice. She would claim the men had hurt her and she was acting in self-defense, but the jury saw through her lies. We're sitting on the floor watching TV and she just come out and said, I have something to tell you. And I asked her what? And she said that she had and killed a man that day. In February 1993, she was sentenced to six life sentences. If anyone was destined to end up here on death row, it was probably Lee Wuornos. Psychologists sketch a portrait of a damaged person with a lurid history of abuse that began in childhood. And it was while she was on death row that she began to make some wild claims. I never hated men, but now I do. I mean, not all, I have a category. I hate those male God. I hate those male cops. Real bad, because they're dirt balls. The cops, the judges, the lawyers, they're all male. In 2002, she tried to convince the world that she was finding dirt, saliva, and other body fluids inside her food which she claims could only have come from the prison guards. She claimed the guards were trying to get her to take her own life, something she had tried in the past during her most challenging times. She also made constant complaints about her living conditions, which may have been an attempt to get herself off of death row, or at least buy herself some sympathy. Unfortunately, nobody was buying her wild claims. In a last ditch effort, she gave several television interviews, and these interviews gave a glimpse into the mind of a sadistic killer. That's why I don't care if I'm executed and leave this planet. Her final sentence was carried out on October 9th, 2002, when she was given a dose of lethal injection. Many death row prisoners protest their eventual sentence, but this next killer could not wait to die. Gary Gilmore led a life of crime from an early age, being arrested at only 14 years old in 1964 and sentenced to 15 years in prison for armed robbery and assault. He was paroled in 1976 and from there looked like he was on course to lead a normal life, taking jobs where he could. But as often happens, this criminal found himself reverting to his old ways and just a few months after his parole, he would upgrade his status from thief to murderer. Gilmore walked into a gas station in Utah and he was armed and dangerous. Robbing the store, he then fatally wounded the gas station employee before fleeing the scene. Year old Max Jensen was killed by Gilmore in 1976 at a service station in Orem. But he hadn't finished there. And the next day he robbed a motel, again firing at an employee, Ben Bushnell. 
This time there was a witness, Bushnell's wife. Even worse, Gilmore accidentally fired at himself in the hand while trying to hide the murder weapon, an injury that would eventually lead to his arrest. Gilmore had taken his truck to be repaired just before he robbed the motel and opened fire on Bushnell. When he went to collect his car the next day, the garage owner saw the damage to Gilmore's hand and alerted the police. But his arrest was down to his own cousin, Brenda, who Gilmore had turned to for help. She alerted the police, who arrested Gilmore a short time later. His trial in 1976 concluded in only two days. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. It was Gilmore's response that shocked the entire world. From the outset, Gilmore wanted to be executed and chose the firing squad instead of hanging. Not only did he not appeal his sentence, which is unusual in and of itself, he also asked his own mother and legal team not to appeal either. I simply accepted a sentence that was given to me. I've accepted sentences all my life. He would even start a hunger protest when his execution was delayed several times. But this was still not enough and in desperation, Gilmore attempted to take his own life twice. National and international media converged at the Utah State Prison. Protesters held vigils. January 17, 1997, and Gilmore would get his wish. He had chosen death by firing squad, and as they strapped him to the chair, he uttered some of the most famous last words ever, as he simply said, Let's do it. Which brings us to our most evil killer today, and one who claimed he would continue to take lives if he was ever released. Wesley Allen Dodd's criminal life began at only 13 years old. His crimes were amongst some of the worst. He would engage in a spree of attacks on children who he hurt for his own pleasure. He would often offer to babysit for various parents, and when he had their children, he would enact his sordid fantasies. I said there's times I think about what I've done, uh, I think about some of the things the boys said before they died, and, and that's real hard to think about. Even the pleas of his victims could not stop this monster. Over a decade, he would hurt at least 50 children, and was only caught when a kidnapping went wrong and he was arrested by the police. And I've been arresting kids nonstop since I was 13 years old over half my life. During the investigation, Dodd confessed to the killing of three boys, and in his house was plenty of evidence to send this man to death row. I can guarantee I'd do it again, and sooner or later I would kill another child. I've done it before, and at the time I liked it. He had kept underwear and other items of clothing from his victims, and even kept a detailed log of what he had done to each victim. He was convicted of first-degree murder and attempted kidnapping, and was sentenced to death in 1990. While waiting for his final day, he granted several interviews, and what he said during those interviews is truly shocking. On January 5th, 1993, Dodd took his final breath, in the gallows. And I know that's the only way I can guarantee I'm not gonna hurt anybody else. Each of these sick and twisted individuals received the penalty they deserved, but it is how these killers acted after they were convicted that shows us the true effects that sitting on death row can have on the human mind. Let me know what you think about this case, and don't forget to like and subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can keep up with every new case.